Hello, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Eric Bricker, and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is risk adjustment secret sauce. Now, if as always, if we could do a quick audio video check in your com in the comments section of either YouTube or LinkedIn, if you could put in if you can see and hear me okay, that would be great. I also want to encourage you this morning, I always like to see where everyone is viewing from. So if you wouldn't mind putting in where you're tuning in from, that would be awesome. We actually had somebody from Croatia last week. We That was our first time having somebody from Croatia. But regardless of where in the world you're from, welcome. Now, as you're putting in where you are tuning in, I'm just going to briefly go over who I am. So again, I'm Dr. Eric Bricker. I'm an internist and I used to be a hospital finance consultant. Then I went on to medical school at the University of Illinois. Then I did residency at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. I then went on to work as a a hospitalist physician uh, with the Baylor Healthcare System here in the Dallas, Texas area. And I also simultaneously started a healthcare navigation firm called Compass Professional Health Services that I started with two other partners. And we grew that to over 2,000 employer clients and 1.8 million people that we helped navigate the U.S. healthcare system and their health insurance. Um, employers would hire us to support their employee benefits plan. And then we sold that business in 2018. And I had a lot of uh, work with um, brokers and benefits consultants and heads of HR and CEOs and CFOs. And so I wanted to continue to educate the community about how healthcare really works because it was still a mystery to a lot of people, especially how the money works in healthcare. So that's why I created the A Healthcare Z videos to, to explain to people how the money works in healthcare. Now, I've been very fortunate to also become the medical director for Simple Pay Health as well, which is an alternative health plan. Now, all of you have put in where you are tuning in from. So let's take a look here. Thank you so much from New York City and Pennsylvania and New Jersey and Pittsburgh and St. Louis and Connecticut and Miami and Oklahoma City and Atlanta and Cyprus. Wonderful. I assume you mean in the Mediterranean Sea. Welcome. Kalamazoo, Michigan, Maryland. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you all. Detroit, Charleston, South Carolina, San Antonio, uh, Chennai, India. Thank you for joining from India. Uh, New York, New York again, Wilton, Connecticut, Boston, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Indianapolis, St. Louis. Another from India. Thank you so much. Rochester, New York, locally here in Dallas where I am. Park City, Utah. Thank you for getting up early. So I, I always appreciate it when people in mountain time and uh, Pacific time uh, tune in because you got to get up super uh, relatively early in order to watch these things. Fort Lauderdale, Marietta, Georgia. Thank you all so much for joining. It's great to see all of you. Now, um, on to risk adjustment. Today's topic for today. So risk adjustment has huge financial implications in healthcare. And so that's why we're talking about it. So if we're going to talk about risk adjustment, let's go to the source, healthcare.gov. What is the definition of risk adjustment? It is a statistical process that takes into account the underlying health status and health spending of enrollees in an insurance plan when looking at their healthcare outcomes and healthcare costs. So you look at a patient and you say, okay, are they going to do better in terms of their diabetes? Are they going to be more expensive in terms of their diabetes? You look at a patient with cancer. Are they going to survive longer with their cancer? How much is their cancer care going to cost? And the answer is, it's going to be different. And if, especially if you're going to measure that, then you need to risk adjust. Because if you look at a doctor and you say, hey, Dr. Bricker, your patients, they tend to like die much quicker than Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith. And 
you spend a lot more money taking care of these, use a lot more healthcare resources taking care of these patients compared to Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith than I, like every other doctor in America says, well, my patients are sicker. It's not my fault. I've got sicker patients. That's why they die earlier. And that's why it takes so much more healthcare resources to take care of them. And so risk adjustment is the process that's used to account for that. Now, Specifically, as it relates to the money in healthcare, risk adjustment is used to determine the payments by CMS to health insurance companies that have Medicare Advantage plans. So the sicker the more chronic conditions, the more severe conditions that a Medicare Advantage beneficiary has, the more money that the federal government gives to the health insurance company to provide, to, to pay out the doctors in the hospitals, et cetera, to take care of that Medicare Advantage beneficiary. So how the number of chronic conditions and the severity of those chronic conditions is measured, is done with a process um, that uses something called hierarchical condition categories, HCC. Hierarchical, it's a hard word to say. It's a lot of syllables, okay? HCCs. So these, we've talked a lot about codes on a healthcare Z. There are ICD-10 diagnosis codes. There are CPT procedure codes. There are DRDG diagnosis-related group codes for inpatient stays. There are HICS-PIX codes for uh, additional things like infusions. So this is yet another completely separate set of codes, these HCC codes. Now, they are not applied to all diagnoses. So they're applied to acute and chronic conditions, like serious acute conditions and chronic con and, and, and some chronic conditions, but not all. So for, for example, like eczema is a skin condition. It's a chronic condition. There is no HCC category code for eczema. However, there is one for diabetes. There is one for uh, different types of cancer. Okay. Now, as I said previously, it is used by Medicare to project future costs, and therefore the HCCs are used by CMS to determine their payments to Medicare Advantage plans, but then also the reimbursement to ACOs, and then also how much they pay Obamacare or, HC, uh, or ACA plans as well. So probably the largest financial implication is for Medicare Advantage, but it also has financial implications for ACOs and ACA plans or Obamacare plans. Now, I'm going to blow this up here so that you can see more clearly how HCCs are created. So whenever a patient is seen, the, the doctor, nurse, physician's assistant, et cetera, they will put in an ICD-10 diagnosis code. And there's over 60,000 ICD-10 diagnosis codes ranging from diabetes to COPD to eczema to cancer, you name it, to depression. All right, now, those ICD-10 codes are then grouped into diagnosis groups. Those diagnosis groups are then combined into condition categories and then there are hierarchies imposed on those condition categories so that a person is only coded with the most severe manifestation of disease. So in other words, when you look at a person's various uh, ICD-10 diagnosis codes, there could be an ICD-10 diagnosis code for diabetes without uh, complications, and there could be a diagnosis for diabetes with complications. And with for the same person, and again, because there's there's huge error with how um, it, it's it's kind of loosey goosey how ICD-10 codes are applied to. Now it shouldn't be loosey goosey, but in practicality it is. Um, and so in that situation, when one person, Mary, let's say, has two different 
ICD-10 uh, codes for diabetes without complications and diabetes with complications. It's only the diabetes with complications that's used, okay? And then those HCCs are then included for payment. And th the rest of this presentation is going to explain how the HCCs are then translated into the payment amount by CMS to the Medicare Advantage insurance plan. Now, let's look. There's a now there's about 80 to 90 HCCs. Now notice the HCCs have very basic numbers. One, two, six, eight, nine. So you can see it makes some skips in there, right? 12, 17, okay. Then it has a description. So like HCC1 is for HIV AIDS. And then there is a coefficient attached to each HCC. You can see here, the coefficients are 0 0.47, 0 0.535, 0 0.440. That coefficient is also referred to as a risk adjustment factor. Basically, the higher the risk adjustment factor, the more severe either the acute or the chronic condition, and therefore, the more money that CMS is going to pay the Medicare Advantage plan. So you can see here, that for something like sepsis, it's pretty significant. It's 0.53. Now, if you go here to metastatic cancer and acute leukemia, I'll just tell you right now, this is like the high, one of the highest, if not the highest HCC at 2.484. Let's look at some other ones. You can see other cancers. I mean, lung cancer is still severe. It's 0 0.7, 0 0.973. Lymphoma, other cancers, 0. 0.672. Colon cancer, 0. 0.317, also bladder. And then breast, prostate, and other cancers, tumors. See how it's less, 0. 0.154. Now, we again, we have diabetes, right? So we have diabetes with acute complications, 0. 0.368. Diabetes with chronic complications, it's the same, 0. 0.368. Diabetes without complications, look at this, much lower, right? Because diabetes without complications is largely a silent disease. 0.118. Now, look here at the bottom. Isn't this interesting? Morbid obesity, so just weight alone, has a significant risk adjustment factor coefficient of 0.365. Now, most people with morbid obesity are also going to have diabetes. So, and I'll show you on a, on our next slide. What happens is, is that each now people can have more than one HCC. Therefore, the risk adjustment factors or, or these coefficients then additive. You add them together. So, in other words, if somebody has morbid obesity and they have diabetes with uh, acute complications, then you would add the two together. Now, note here that the Medicare Advantage plan makes more money the more diagnoses and the sicker each of their beneficiaries are. Notice also that the Medicare Advantage plan makes more money the more obese their plan members are. So if, and so a morbid obesity is defined as a having a body mass index, a BMI of greater than 40. Okay, to put that in context, a BMI of 40 is a person who is 5'8", who is about 260 pounds. And so if the Medicare Advantage plan and the physician actually worked to, to have the person lower their weight, which of course is the better thing for their health, the Medicare Advantage plan would make less money. The Medicare Advantage plan is disincentivized to have their plan members lose weight because if they lose weight, they won't get paid as much. And so we're gonna talk about the implications of this methodology for the financial incentives for doing the right things for patients, okay? Next up, so I talked about the risk adjustment factor. Okay, so coefficients are assigned to each HCC according to how much cost they are expected to incur on traditional Medicare fee-for-service payments. So in other words, what they do is they take traditional Medicare claims and they look at how much traditional Medicare claims people with these conditions create, and then they base the 
coefficients off of that. Therefore, the higher the risk adjustment factor, the more severe the disease, the higher the cost, and then the higher the payment to Medicare Advantage. So let's then go through in more detail how then the HCCs and the risk adjustment factors apply to a specific individual. And so this is an incredibly important chart. So please pay attention. So there is a basic demographic coefficient that is applied to every beneficiary. You can see here for a woman who is 75, her demographic coefficient is 0 0.448. So as you can imagine, in general, the older you are, the more healthcare costs you incur. So if you're a beneficiary who is only 65, your coefficient is going to be lower. And if you're a beneficiary who's 85, your, your coefficient is going to be higher. So here for a beneficiary of zero of uh, 75, their coefficient is 0 0.448. Now, let's say they have COPD. Now the coefficient for C, the, the RAF for COPD is 0 0.428. Three, two, eight. So fine. So COPD, that's emphysema. Now let's say, and this is like a decision tree. Okay. Is, does it, has this person had a heart attack or have they not had a heart attack? Let's say they've also had a heart attack. I've seen lots of patients who have emphysema who have also had heart attacks. Then for a, a heart attack, an acute myocardial infarction, the HCC is 0 0.233. Okay. Now, Let's let's just take a look to see if they have continuing chest pain. So angina pectoris is is, is heart related chest pain. Let's say they actually have heart related chest pain after they've had their heart attack, and that happens sometimes. Well, then, if they continue to have heart related chest pain after their heart attack, then they have a, another HCC of zero point one four. So to get the full risk adjustment factor for this person, you would add the 0 0.448 from their demographic uh, risk adjustment factor to the 0 0.328 for their COPD plus the 0 0.233 for their acute myocardial infarction plus the 0 0.14 for their angina. And that adds up to 1.149. So the HCCs are additive. Therefore, the more HCCs you have, the higher the total risk adjustment score and the higher the payment by Medicare to the Medicare Advantage plan. So next up. So CMS was wise to this and they noticed, hmm, we see that people on Medicare Advantage plans tend to be getting a lot of diagnoses and they tend to be getting a lot of severe diagnoses and when we compare that to people with traditional medicare like in general the number of diagnoses and the severity of the diagnoses for the medicare advantage people it seems to be more and so they said hey i think i being cms i think the way that the doctors and the medicare advantage plan are coding these Medicare Advantage beneficiaries is overstating how sick they really are. So they put in this minimum coding intensity adjustment. In other words, there was quote unquote too much coding intensity for Medicare Advantage. And so we're going to decrease the overall Medicare, re, uh, uh, Medicare Advantage reimbursement by 5.9% just because we think basically they're like, you're up coding. So we're just going to decrease that up coding by 5.9%. They established that in 2018. However, CMS has never changed that 5.9% since 2018. It has remained static. Now, why do Medicare Advantage beneficiaries have more diagnoses than traditional fee-for-service? Well, it could be because Obviously, the financial incentive for the Medicare Advantage plans to have more diagnoses and more severe diagnoses for their beneficiaries, but also it could be because the traditional Medicare beneficiaries are actually undercoded in terms of the number of diagnoses and the severity of the diagnoses. And why is that? It's because payment by traditional fee-for-service Medicare for all outpatient surgery. So if you have outpatient surgery 
or if you have out, you know, all outpatient surgeries, it's based on the CPT procedure code. It's not based on the diagnosis at all. And so like when I was at uh, Hopkins, a lot of the doctors, especially doing in the clinic outpatient, they were like, they would even tell me, they're like, yeah, check whatever you want on the diagnosis. It really doesn't matter. What really matters is the procedure code for the visit that you're going to check off on the billing sheet. So make sure that you really pay attention to that CPT code. But for the diagnosis, eh, as long as you're in the ballpark, it's okay, right? So, and uh, obviously you do use diagnosis for inpatient services, but remember, uh, the majority of services these days are actually outpatient services. So it's based on the CPT. So just know that there probably is some undercoding of diagnoses for uh, traditional Medicare beneficiaries in addition to the over, potential overcoding for the Medicare Advantage folks. Now, next slide. Let's talk about the implication of Medicare Advantage to health insurance carriers like United, which is the largest Medicare Advantage uh, health insurance company in America, Humana, which is the second largest Elephants, which used to be Anthem, which is like the third largest for Centene and for Aetna and for Cigna. So all of these major health... Now, a lot of hospital systems actually have smaller Medicare Advantage plans as well. So these health insurance plans are incentivized to maximize the capture of beneficiary diagnoses in order to boost their HCCs, which then boost the RAFs which then boosts the per member per month payments. Now, Medicare Advantage payments to health insurance plans totaled $361 billion in 2021. That is a huge industry. This is like one little teeny tiny segment of healthcare and it's $361 billion. And just a few short years ago, six years ago in 2015 or six years before 2021 in 2015, it was only $175 billion. It doubled in six years. This is why Medicare Advantage is the largest driver of health insurance carrier revenue growth and profit growth. On A Healthcare Z, we talk a lot about commercial insurance and employer sponsored health plans, but you got to remember that you are just a very small piece of importance to United, Blue Cross, Cigna, Aetna, et cetera, compared to their Medicare Advantage business. Their Medicare Advantage business is a much bigger deal than you, okay? Medicare Advantage is LeBron James, and you are like an okay high school basketball player if you're an employer-sponsored plan, okay? Now, there is so much money in capturing these HCCs that a company whose job, like the reason they exist is to send nurses to people's houses to capture their diagnoses and boost their HCCs. That company is called Signify Health. Now in the news, it was referred to as a quote unquote home health company, but their main purpose was just to gather HCCs from Medicare Advantage beneficiaries in their homes. And CVS Health bought Signify Health for $8 billion just recently. So this is a huge deal. Now, of course, it's such a huge deal that there has potentially been some nefarious behavior by the health insurance companies. So the New York Times did an article that I'll show you the sources at the end here, where they looked at all the major health insurance carriers, Medicare Advantage plans, and they say, okay, were they accused by fraud of fraud by a whistleblower? Were they accused of fraud by the U.S. government? Had they overbilled according to the inspector general? Look at this, United Health Group. Yes to all three. Humana, yes to two out of the three. CVS, yes to one out of the three. Elevance, which used to be Anthem, yes to two out of the three. Kaiser, yes to two out of the three. Centene, zero out of the three. Blue Cross of Michigan, one out of the three. Cigna, three out of the three. 
Highmark, which is one of the Blue Cross plans on the East Coast, one out of the three. And Scan Group uh, out on the West Coast is three out of three. So there have been major issues with all of the health insurance carriers around unscrupulous behavior around fraud uh, and overbilling. So what are the implications for doctors, hospitals, and providers? Okay, so the, the, the Medicare Advantage health insurance carriers then take the money that the government has given them and then they pay out to the doctors in the hospital to actually take care of the people. Keep in mind, the health insurance company doesn't actually take care of them, okay? It's the doctors and the hospitals that take care of the people, okay? Now, now I'm not going to get into vertical integration and how United now has doctors and blah, 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 okay? But you get my point. So Medicare Advantage has prior authorizations and traditional Medicare does not. And this is important because the more um, money that the Medicare Advantage plan can receive in premiums and then the less claims that they have to pay out, then the Medicare Advantage plan gets to keep the difference. Now, there, it is a minimum loss ratio for Medicare Advantage plans. It, it is the 15%. They have to pay out the 85%. But the Medicare Advantage plans put in place prior authorization so they, they get v as close as they humanly possible to that 85% of claims paid out so that they can keep the maximum 15%. So they put in prior authorizations as a way to fine tune as a rheostat, as a thermostat to, to precisely control how much they're paying out to doctors and hospitals so that they can hit their quarterly numbers in terms of uh, profit margin on their quarterly calls. And if you listen to a quarterly insurance call, their minimum loss ratio or expense ratio or benefit ratio, every single insurance carrier has a different name. That is a key statistic that the Wall Street analysts watch. Now, Medicare Advantage has prior authorizations. Traditional Medicare does not. So with the tremendous growth of Medicare Advantage has come the tremendous growth in prior authorizations for the care of people over the age of 65. So doctors and hospitals have done and will continue to need to do more and more prior authorizations due to the growth of Medicare Advantage plans. Now, to put it in context, UHC does 13 million prior authorizations per year, and they just added prior authorizations for colonoscopies. So this is a huge burden for doctors and hospitals because it costs a lot of money to administratively go through all the hoops of prior authorizations. And then if there's a denial to clean it up on the back end, it costs $1 for every $7 of revenue to collect, to bill and collect and do prior authorizations for a primary care physicians. And specialists are as high as 25%. So a, a physician practice or a hospital has to spend anywhere from one in every $7 to one in every $4 in billing just to get paid. And that is only going to get worse because of the growth of prior authorizations from Medicare Advantage. So this has huge implications for hospital systems and physicians. Now, here are my take-home points as we approach the end. And I want you to think of any questions or comments that you also want to add so, we can add, so I can address them at the end. So here are the take-home points for today. Risk adjustment incentivizes Medicare Advantage plans to have sicker patients and then restrict care. Now, some would argue that, well, there's a lot of overutilization in America and a lot of the care that's being provided to Medicare beneficiaries is stuff that shouldn't be done. And that is true. I'm in no way saying that's false. However, restriction of care is a blunt instrument. And so therefore, when you are restricting the overutilization and the unnecessary care, there is also tremendous restriction of necessary care. So here you are trying to stop the overutilization and in the process, you are stopping incredibly helpful and 
pain alleviating and life elongating utilization. Okay. So just know that the current process of care restriction is highly error prone. Next, in this setup of Medicare Advantage with the HCCs and the risk adjustment, the insurance carriers are winning hand over fist and the hospitals are losing hand over fist. This Medicare Advantage freight train has left the station and it is going to continue to move. To complain about it and to think that it is going to change, in my opinion, is naive. However, hospitals must start their own Medicare Advantage plans, and many already have. So two examples, the, a relatively small hospital system, the Cone Hospital System in North Carolina and the Novant Hospital System in North Carolina, both have Medicare Advantage plans. They got like 25,000, 50,000 beneficiaries. I would argue that almost every hospital system in America should be starting their own Medicare Advantage plan because then you can have more control over the revenue, in other words, the premium from the government, and you can have more control over the prior authorizations so that these non-profit, I would rather have a non-profit hospital system do this than a for-profit health insurance company that answers to shareholders, okay? Because ultimately, I think that if you got the right people on the board of directors of the hospital system, then you could create a prior authorization process for a hospital system run Medicare Advantage plan that frankly is much more ethical than what is currently being done by health insurance companies. And when I mean ethical, all I mean is the application of the golden rule, okay? So this is not some sort of highfalutin conversation. It's like, okay, can you create a Medicare Advantage plan that you would be willing to put your mom on? That's the question. And I would argue that you might not wanna put your mom on a Medicare Advantage plan from a health insurance carrier, but, you might want to put your mom on a Medicare Advantage plan from a medic, uh, from one that's started by a hospital system. Now, it's not guaranteed. You can still have nefarious behavior. But ultimately, that's the, that's the litmus test. Is this the type of plan you would put your mom on? Okay? So, do we need to rein in the gaming of risk adjustment? Do we need to rein in the prior authorizations and denials? These are all questions that will need to be asked. So with that, I want to, oh yeah, here are all the sources. Um, if you would like the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a copy of these slides, please email me at ericb at a to connect with me on uh, LinkedIn, if you would like. Um, as you are emailing me or as you are connecting with me on LinkedIn, if you wouldn't mind giving this a thumbs up on YouTube and LinkedIn, that would be a huge favor for me and it will help share the video with other people who couldn't attend and so that way they can watch the replay of it. Now, let me briefly go to your questions. I'm gonna answer them in reverse order. Okay, this might be a workaround. Can you sometimes speak in more detail on Novant and Cone? Okay, maybe we talk. So thank you for your suggestion. Thank you for that. Okay. So do fee-for-service health systems have an incentive to, to do HCC and RAF coding, or is it on the plan to document the codes for the patients? Great question, Matthew. Uh, it is on the plan. So if the hospital and the um, physician practice is just billing fee for service, then frankly, they are not going to go through the effort of maximizing their diagnoses and their HCCs, which is why companies like Signify exist. Good question. Sherry says prior authorization can impact spend by sharing high uh, the highest value service AI prompts can use uh, it can be a big pain point and is not uh, simple uh, across the industry. Okay, good point, Sherry. Thank you for sharing. Sharon says an MA is required.
requiring increasingly greater and greater prior authorizations and denials. Yes, that is correct uh, in my opinion as well. Uh, Stephen asks, if a medical group is taking full risk for Medicare Advantage, why is prior authorization needed? Okay, so this is a great point. So when a primary care physician practice, or it could be multi-specialty, takes on a full risk for the Medicare Advantage population, in addition to prior authorizations, they also have a HMO PCP gatekeeper model. In other words, the Medicare Advantage beneficiary cannot just go out and see a cardiologist on their own. They cannot go out and see a dermatologist on their own. They have to see their primary care first. And their primary care physician not only says whether or not you can or cannot see a cardiologist or a dermatologist, but that primary care uh, that primary care physician also says which cardiologist and dermatologist that that person is going to go to. So just know that one of the other cost control mechanisms for Medicare Advantage is the, the HMO PCP gatekeeper model. Now, there are pros and cons to this. It can be done in an ethical way. It can also be done in a very unethical way. And so the, um, the way that the primary care group then determines the um, or communicates the referrals back to the insurance carrier may require an administrative prior auth just to process the claim. Because remember that with fully capitated um, physician groups with Medicare Advantage, the other downstream providers are still billing fee for service to the plan and they are still um, being adjudicated by the carrier. And so the carrier will still have prior authorization rules for those downstream specialists. So it's complicated, but the short answer, uh, Dr. Campbell, is that administratively it is still required by the MA plan to actually adjudicate the plan, even if the member is with a full risk primary care practice. Woo! Isn't that a mouthful? You got to love healthcare. If you understand what I just said, then you are, you are incredibly uh, sharp. Because this is, I mean, obviously, this is this is so incredibly complicated. It's, it's ridiculous. Okay. Now. Question from Chad here. Did it merit a Medicare Advantage enrollment exceed traditional Medicare enrollment? The answer is yes. It just barely exceeded it this year. So it's essentially 50-50. So Medicare Advantage is just barely more than traditional Medicare. It used to be literally just a few years ago, it was less than 20%. So it has just skyrocketed. How is it that hypertension, the second leading cause of coronary artery disease, doesn't have? All right. Yeah. So Dr. Dominguez makes a very good point. How does hypertension not have an HCC? Because it's not severe enough. So again, the HCC system financially rewards Medicare Advantage plans for having sicker patients. So if you really wanted to game the HCC system, you would actually not treat their hypertension so that they actually developed end organ damage like nephropathy or like having a heart attack so that they could then have an HCC so that you could then get paid more, okay? So like that is not a good setup. The fact that we are actually incentivizing profit-driven corporations in America to have people be sicker is not a good idea. Okay, so this needs to be rethought. Does a uh, great question here by uh, Shiloh, does risk stratification and HCCs have an impact on the premiums paid by the beneficiaries? Okay, so this is a great question. This will be the last one because we're going way over. Thank you all for being patient. So the premium that the beneficiary themselves pays, there's, there's, believe it or not, there's more rules ultimately that apply to 
how much the government pay, pays the Medicare Advantage plan based on like their star, their quality ratings and their their star ratings, et cetera. So I haven't even fully described the entire process that determines how much money the Medicare Advantage plan gets from the government. But then each Medicare Advantage plan can then can then can they themselves decide how much they want to then charge the members to be on that Medicare Advantage plan, okay? So it is, it's not necessarily the case that if you have a very high risk adjustment payment out to the plan, that the plan would then charge the member a lot. The plan might charge the member zero. Some Medicare Advantage plan have zero premiums. Now they still got to pay their Part B premium, but they don't have to pay any additional premium to the Medicare Advantage plan. Or sometimes it's super low; it's only like eight dollars a month. Okay. Likewise, it doesn't correlate with them having a very low risk adjustment score either. So the Medicare Advantage plan can still decide on its own how much it wants to charge in premium for the members, independent of what they're being paid by the government. Thank you for your question. And with that, we'll end. Okay, guys, this has been a super complicated topic, but it's super important because literally there are hundreds of billions of dollars at stake as we go through this process. So thank you all for watching. Have a fantastic Friday. Have a great weekend, and we will see you all next week. Bye now.